Welcome to the One Inside, an internal family systems podcast. I'm your host, Tammy Sellenberger. On today's episode, I chat with Steve Spitzer and Glenn Williams about masculinity in Jericho Circles. I am so excited to tell you about the Heirloom Summit, which is co-created by Duran Young, founder of Black Therapist Rock, and Dick Swartz, founder of IFS. It is intentionally taking place during Black History Month on February 26th through the 28th. We are going to be offering this collective healing experience as a powerful opportunity to explore the legacy burden of racism and anti-Blackness. Using IFS, we will explore the witnessing and unburdening process to work towards increased self-leadership and to begin repairing the personal impact of our traumatic history as a nation. Stay tuned for a link for the listeners of the One Inside podcast so you can receive a discount when you register. Hey everyone, I am so excited about this episode. This is the first in the series leading up to the Heirloom Summit, and I hope you will join us for that. I think it's going to be really great. Steve and Glenn and I have an amazing conversation, and I I can't even really describe. I, I just, it's really good. So uh, Steve is a retired professor of sociology from Suffolk University in Boston, and he has taught, researched, and written on crime, justice, and social control for three decades. He is level two IFS trained and presented on his use of the IFS model inside prisons at multiple IFS annual conferences, and he's written several articles for the IFS newsletter, The Outlook. In 2002, he founded the Jericho Circle Project, a nonprofit organization that seeks to bring down the walls by creating men's groups and correctional facilities. Glenn participated in the Jericho groups when he was incarcerated, and he later met Steve in a completely different context. It's a great story. I will let them tell it. Glenn pays it forward at his organization, Our House Boston. Glenn is level one IFS trained and is passionate about spreading the word about our true essence, especially to black men in urban settings. He is a re-entry advocate and community investor who works with various individuals, families, and organizations to raise awareness about and create solutions to the challenges of incarceration and prisoner reintegration. So let me just give you some themes and we'll just get started. There's so much about the idea of discovery. We talk a lot about masculinity. We talk about, obviously, the men's work inside prisons. They talk about climbing out of the man box and taking off masks. We talk about the importance of power for black men, which I thought was interesting. Glenn says these two quotes that I loved. He says, who I pretend to be, what my community and society says I need to be in order to survive, and my essence are not the same thing. Who I pretend to be and my essence are not the same thing. And then he says, IFS offers the opportunity for self-discovery and self-exploration. And think of that inside and outside prison. Discovering that my shame and guilt are parts of me and do not have to define who I am at my core. You can find out more about Jericho Circle at jerichocircle.org. There's also a 90-minute documentary about uh, sort of the same nature of the group work that they do, and that is um, on the show notes. It's at topic.com backslash the work. To register for the Heirloom Summit, go to Black Therapist Rock and find the link there. I was hoping to have a special link for the IFS podcast listeners, but not yet. So hopefully soon. I'd love to connect with you at IFS Tammy on Instagram and Twitter and on the One Inside Facebook page. Enjoy. So Steve, let's start with you. If you were to see out your window, like tell everybody where you are in the world. And if you were to look out your window and if it was daytime, what would you see out the window? Well, I'd see some trees. I'd see a bird feeder, which is something I look at a lot, which uh, is very uh, soothing to see the little birds arriving and departing Mm -hmm. on their flights around the neighborhood. Uh, And uh, it's a little grass and a patio kind of thing. So uh, I'm in a condo complex, so it's not 
you know that fancy, but it's it's a nice uh, setting, and uh, uh, on the edge of the of the woods, so it's kind of little nature. That's nice. And, nice to be in a condo yeah. and have that too. Sort of have both yeah. best of both worlds. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Glenn? And you're in, in Steve. You're in Massachusetts. Yes, I'm. I'm outside of Boston, uh, west of Boston. And Glenn, what about you? Where are you in the world? And um, I'm in Boston, Massachusetts, and it's um, nightfall as well. So what I would see is a lot of um, activity because I'm right in the heart of um, Mattapan. I would definitely see a lot of hustle and bustle, a lot of traffic, a lot of um, stores, a lot of young people um, going to the park, coming from the park, um, a lot of um, community members just coming to and fro. So it's um, just a lot of um, activity, a lot of community. Yeah, just a lot of activity. Um, very, very vibrant. So yeah, you know, I just, I, sometimes I just like um, going on the front porch and just watching all of the activity, just all of the activity in the community. So it's very bright, um, vibrant. I love it. And I love that you describe it as your feet. It feels like community to you. It doesn't feel mm-hmm. like stress or commotion or chaos. It's like, it just feels mm-hmm. like community. Yes. Yes, indeed. I love it. So why don't we start with, um, Steve, do you want to talk a little bit about the Jericho project and sort of what that is? And maybe we can talk about how you met Glenn and how Glenn got involved. Sure. Um, Start there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Almost 20 years ago, I did a men's weekend uh, to kind of uh, have a little adventure and wanting to... uh, to uh, explore some things about who I was. And so it was one of those uh, opportunities to, uh, to test new, new boundaries. And on that weekend, uh, I discovered that um, I, I came up with a mission. And part of my mission for the weekend was to, uh, to go out and do this kind of work and change the world and change myself at the same time. And so do that this was kind the, of work uh, meaning what does that mean? Like oh, that? meaning 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 personal work, uh, emotionally based oh. uh, investigation of who I am and uh, developing emotional literacy. I think that's the the term that we often use to talk about what we do. So people getting to know what goes on inside and then uh, learn things about. Uh, how they respond to the world and what we uh, what we have uh, discovered about ourselves and what we need to discover still, what we don't know yet. And what made you decide, I don't know if you decided that weekend, but what made you decide to do that in a jail or prison context? Well, as I said, there's, there's this little exercise that they do on the weekend and, and Glenn's done the weekend too, so he knows about it, uh, which is about uh, discovering your mission in the world. And so the mission in the world has to do with two things. One is um, the the goal that you have, uh, your vision, and the other is the action that you want to take to get to that goal or vision. So that's uh, um, what came to me on my weekend was that I wanted to do the same kind of work they were doing there with the emotional development exploration, but do it with men in prisons. Because I had been a professor for years and done work in criminal justice, uh, I I knew I always had an interest in that, but instead of being academic, it was much more about getting into the nitty gritty of, of feeling and experience and working with people in that setting. So that's what came to me and as a way to kind of live my uh, contribution to the world, uh, to explore that. And so that's, that's how I came upon it. I love and it. I, ended up, I ended up recruiting Glenn to do a similar weekend uh, some years later um, so he could get the taste of it also. But it's kind of a, of a kickoff, a kind of starting point for um, 
looking into uh, the parts of ourselves and uh, it's a way to, to, to feel into um, what's really critical for um, uh, understanding on a deeper level who we are as men. So it's a piece about exploring masculinity as part of the work. Uh, and I thought, well, this, and I found out about a program, a project they had out of Folsom, California, uh, at the prison there, which is pretty famous prison, you know, the one that Johnny Cash used to sing about. Anyway, uh, but I, I realized that in do, doing some reading, I, I saw that they're doing the same thing in this prison. Mm -hmm. And maybe if I could learn something about what that looks like. I could come and bring it back to Massachusetts and the area of New England and do something similar. So that's what happened. I, I begged and pleaded and I finally got on the weekend that they were doing out there. And uh, it blew me away completely because they, they were doing such deep work with men who were doing time, usually life inside prison uh, uh, to really find themselves for the first time that I said, wow, if they can do it here, you know, I certainly want to do it in my own backyard and see whether uh, we could replicate something like that. So that's where my inspiration came from for that specifically. And yeah. so you do, there's a part of me that just wants to just sort of talk through like logically. So is it is it these groups that you do like weekly, monthly, and then sometimes do these weekend retreats with men in prison, and then you have volunteers that go in and you have like several different prisons are doing this in it. Is that, am I getting that right? Yes, yes. Um, well, actually the first place that I started it was in uh, a federal prison outside of uh, Boston. And uh, I, it was a place that I could get into and there was a psychologist there who was available to help me set up the program and work with me. And uh, she, was, she saw that, immediately saw the value of men's work to happen inside prisons. And so she was very interested in that. And she had a background in, in African ritual. So she ended up uh, kind of uh, helping me develop some things and some pro approaches that were very helpful in that, in that context. Uh, so what happened there was um, we recruited volunteers, most of whom I already knew through the men's organization. And we started set weekly groups, we set up weekly groups. In fact, we started the first week after 9-11, which was in September 2001. And uh, so that was a kind of momentous time to be doing this kind of, of adventure. And uh, we got it going really uh, pretty quickly. And that's how we, uh, how we set up the model and the, and the development. We, but the, pretty much I was, I was basing it on what they had done at this other prison. And I saw that what was possible was that people could take responsibility, accountability, ownership, and they could also get to know themselves more deeply at the same time and therefore show up more fully as men in society in a more mature way. So that's where, where it came from. And so um, did you, were you doing IFS from the beginning? Like had you studied IFS and no, okay. Tell no, me about, yeah, no. Tell me about how well, that... so my, as I said, this is kind of organic. It came out of my experience on this weekend and what they were doing, a lot of what they were doing, I later found out was psychodrama Okay. Uh, on the weekend where, you know, they were doing this, these intense processes where people were getting to look at very deep issues that they were carrying. Um, and of course I didn't have a, I mean, I just a sociologist and academic at the time I was thinking, well, this is really cool stuff. But what would ha was happening was I, I realized that the changes that were occurring for these men and for myself when I did my weekend were much deeper than what I was getting out of my therapy sessions. So that immediately attracted me to it because it was so experiential mm -hmm. and it was based on really looking uh, deep within in a way which I wasn't really doing with my talk therapy at all. Yeah. 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 So that's, that's, well, that was my original exposure to it. And then, and then, uh, uh, you know, I, I called, I, that was 20 years ago. So uh, a after that, I got to do more work of that sort uh, 
and we started setting up our programs in different prisons, but the first one was this federal prison. And then, um, so Glenn, tell me about your experience, whatever you feel comfortable sharing. And as Steve's talking, what's coming up for me is, I don't know, I guess I just want to say what's coming up for me is I would imagine it would be really hard to get men in prison to open up about their parts. <laughs> that's what I was thinking. Like, that seems like a really hard task. So I just, I guess I just want to speak for that. And then um, just sort of, I guess, wanted to hear from you, Glenn, about um, how you met Steve and your mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, um, it, it, it's definitely um, hard to get um, men um, to open up their parts, um, especially incarcerated men. Um, so I know that's something that I wrestle with um, for um, a long time, um, but it's something that I needed. So um I was incarcerated, um, 20, which I did 21 years in prison, went in when I was 19 years old for um, a gang related homicide that unfortunately took an innocent man's life. And so, you know, I was incarcerated and just, um, I remember just thinking about at age 19, how did I get here? How, how did I get myself in, um, to this situation? I, you know, I always felt I was a good kid. I came from um, a loving home, you know, a loving community, but um, a community that, that had also a lot of um, issues. And so there were, there were um, quite a few programs when I was incarcerated that I intended that focused on um, education, family, um, fatherhood. But I was always looking for something deeper. Um, I always wanted to do some deeper work. I, I wanted to get more into my own self-discovery, self-exploration. And um, it didn't happen until I think maybe um, 2008 um, when I did the Jericho Circle. So I believe that was the, my first exposure to the Jericho Circle. And I got introduced to doing this work um, around healing, self-exploration. And so that's how I got introduced um, to um, the work in Steve. I was paroled in 2010. And I went into this program called the Granada House. So um, it was a halfway house um, that focused on substance abuse. And... Um, I think it was, um, you know, just a, a, a catalyst for my desire to do community work. And um, I told myself that if I ever got the opportunity, um, I wanted to do something similar. I wanted to do something similar, um, just giving back. And so in 2015, I got the opportunity um, with another woman to co-found Our House Boston, which is a nonprofit organization that focuses on assisting individuals and families that are impacted by incarceration. So I've been doing that work since 2015. And as I was doing the work, a partner of mine said that she wanted to introduce me to someone that um, I should meet someone. And so lo and behold, it was um, Steve, um, Steven Spitzer from the Jericho Circle Project. And so, That's you know, amazing. we just, yes, it's, it's um, it, and I'm not doing the story justice, but <laughs> so we connected, we connected and we've been working ever since. I, I actually showed Steve the uh, certificate that I received when I did the Jericho Circle. And so, which is one of my um, most prized possessions, that um, certificate that I received. And we've been, we've been working together ever since. Um, and, and I've had the great pleasure of being invited to join his board of directors. So um, I'm living my dream. I'm living my dream. I get to continue doing work on myself, um, and I get to pay it forward as well. Steve, what is it like listening to that? I mean, I'm sure you've heard it before. Oh, it's well, it's very gratifying, really, and uh, humbling for me, because I guess that was always, I always had my dream about why I was going into prisons. Um, 
and people would ask, you know, why are you doing this work? What are you getting out of it? And uh, I guess my sense was, you know, if I could make the difference for one person's life to help give them some tools and some opportunities to uh, offer them something that, that was more meaningful in terms of a direction in their life and a discovery of who they really were at the core, um, that would be a great, a great gift for me. So that was, so having Glenn come out and then me meeting him in that way was kind of a dream come true because it was a, a closing of the circle in a different way, you know, that, that he was able to, to enter the community and I was able to join him uh, and we were able to work together because uh, he, he knew things, of course, that I had no idea about because of his own personal experiences with it. And uh, I, I felt that we were gaining a tremendous asset in terms of, of bringing his expertise and his heart into it. It's really about, about and consciousness, just the, a man with, with great consciousness who has made so many discoveries about not just the paths that he had taken, which might have been right or wrong, but about um, the parts of himself which got in his way and the, and the way in which he could tap into his self-energy to begin to feel uh, more fully whole and and to give back in, in, in incredible ways, working with young people or working with people who have been impacted uh, in many different ways. And uh, they even have whims groups at the, at the Our House. They've, they've, they've done uh, a really community service. So that for me is like, oh, this, I had never envisioned that initially, except that it would be great for it to happen. And suddenly it happened that here was the opportunity that we were able to kind of work with each other. And since that time, of course, I've, I've gotten him involved on a lot of different levels uh, and we've been able to work together and, and come up with some uh, pretty amazing uh, discoveries about the value of, of the IFS and its applications. And, and that was a, a place for me to see where the whole principle of bringing back uh, and, and paying back, paying forward was really in operation. Glenn, Steve has used the word discovery a whole bunch of mm-hmm. times. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious if you want to talk about your own discovery of, uh, Steve asked this question, why do I belong in prison? Mm-hmm. And so I'm wondering if that was part of your experience or do you want to talk at all about that dis- dis- that discovery process that Steve Steve's talked about? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I always say that um, I, I, I don't know um, anyone who was more lost, who was more confused just in the world um, than, than I was um, just, just, you know, just a, 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 a young, a young kid um, struggling with a sense of belonging, struggling with a sense of um, identity and then um, ending up incarcerated at uh, 19 years old. So I, I experienced a profound sense of just loss and confusion. And so what I wanted more than anything was to discover my purpose, to discover self. And um, so just the IFS model itself speaks specifically um, to just that challenge that I and a lot of my peers and the population that I I work with. So that's why it resonates um, with me so deeply. It it offers the opportunity for self-discovery, self-exploration. I I also dealt with um, a profound sense of guilt and shame. And so um, the IFS model allows individuals to um, look at our different um, parts, um, those parts that don't define who you are at your core. And so um, for me, I think discovery is at the heart of, of the model. And so, yes, um, for me, it's, it's um, a journey of um, self-discovery and self-exploration. 
So can I ask a possible like stupid white girl question? (laughs) (laughs) And you don't have to answer it if you don't want to. We insist that you do. Okay. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Okay. So stupid white girl question number one is, do you, do you think speaking for as a black man that the idea of discovering that there is a self this that that you're not who that society will say that black men are this and that that actually for you and for the population you work with or just sort of knowing other black men that that's actually so such a big discovery mm-hmm. um i'm cringing it, it, it's, saying it's, that, it's, like. it's it's huge it, it's huge. Um, I, I still wrestle with it to this um, very day. I'm typically um, in environments where I'm the only Black male or the only Black person, and I, I wrestle with feelings of being the stereotype, um, of being the stereotype. And so I think that even even without a quarry, even without a criminal conviction, um, that's typically the the plight of a lot of uh, black and brown men wrestling with the perception, um, wrestling with this societal perception of who you are versus um, who you know you are at your core, who you know at, at um, you know. And so I know for me, the discovery is the most important work. Um, And I think that's with a lot of individuals, especially those that I work with. Um, And it's scary work, it's scary work. And I'll I'll say this um, quickly, Um, you know, even in urban areas and urban communities, a lot of young black men are conditioned to believe that they have to always be strong, always, you know, project a certain image um, that we can't be vulnerable, that we can't ask um, for help when oftentimes that's what we need um, the most. And so I think the the work around self-discovery, um, the work of finding our purpose, our calling, finding our value is um, some of the most important work you can do. So yeah, definitely there's 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 a need, there's a deed, um, especially for black men to know their true purpose um, and get to who they truly are at their um, core. Um, and you know, as um, I, the IFS model um, talks about, you know, um, discovering self, you know, leading from self, coming from a self-led. Um, place as opposed to, you know, these stereotypes, um, these notions of who we are. The protectors, right? Exactly. Like I have a protectors exactly. that tell me I've got to there be you. big and bad. Yes. And I was thinking about that in, um, so in the black community and, and certainly in jail, I'm, sh- I'm sure that protectors have to be forward, right? That mm. there's, there's probably so much, you know, you Right. So not only in that community, but certainly in in jail, you would have to be tough and have to mm-hmm. like. And that's the and that's the and that's the case for all um, individuals, um, whether you're black, white, um, when you're in a um, abnormal environment, you you have to wear. We used to call them masks um, yeah. back then. Um, you, you always had to wear um, your mask. Yes, um, yeah. It was just too risky to tell a, um, a fellow inmate that um, I'm dealing with depression. Yeah. Um, I may have some mental health um, issues. Um, I feel right. um, lonely. I'm afraid. I'm vulnerable. Those are just things you don't do when you're um, incarcerated. And so I think that's the beauty and the value of the Jericho Circle um, project, the work that um, they've been doing. Um, I think um, Steve is modest in um, just describing the the value of the work that um, the Jericho Circle does. But um, it it, it was a heaven sent for me um, because we saw for um, the first time in, a, in many instances that it's okay for men 
um, to be, be vulnerable and talk about your flaws, talk about um, your needs. And so um, we, we, we need more Steven Spitzers of the world. We need more Jericho um, circles of the world. Um, you know, they're just doing some uh, amazing work. And I just feel honored to be a part of this um, work that's giving incarcerated men and formerly incarcerated men um, an opportunity to humanize themselves and um, having a voice. Great thing about IFS, if you allow me to piggyback on that, is uh, that uh, all parts are welcome. So we can look at our so-called weak parts, um, our soft parts, our feminine parts as men, and find a place for them inside and an opportunity to explore uh, what it would mean to give them some space to, to be in the world. And, and so it, the prison's a particularly difficult place for that to happen because of the hyper-masculinity that's built into the environment and the, the, the culture mm-hmm. and the, the structure of that kind of institution. But it's exactly, the paradox is exactly that when you finally get to the place where, I, when I get to the place where I can look at my more vulnerable parts, I can find my humanness at the same time. And that's exactly what we we found is that uh, if you can peel away that outer layer and get to uh, which and get to behind those exiles or beyond those parts that are in a place of needing to posture or create a front or an image or whatever it might be, then you begin to discover that there are tender and beautiful parts inside that you want to give space and, and opportunity to as well. So that's that's a great the great paradox of it, and you know, stepping outside of the man box is extremely liberating, because it's not just you know we, we put ourselves as men in in boxes that whatever the society does it creates that sense that we have to live up to a certain set of role expectations, and that's very limiting, and so anything that can begin to break down those walls begins to open up a sense of fullness in life, a richness, and a contribution sense of what can I contribute? How can I build a better world? How can I pass on my insights to the younger generation? All of that stuff begins to come to the fore, 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 foreground. I was thinking that, that when, both, when both of you were talking, I was thinking IFS is such a beautiful model for this reason, because if I can speak to those parts, right, maybe that, maybe that helps me speak for them because i'm not saying i am lonely but a part of me is lonely and maybe that is that a little bit more helpful for men black men and incarcerated men to be able to speak for parts because then that doesn't feel as vulnerable Mm -hmm. yeah i know i know i know for me it it definitely um just created a shift um i know for a lot of um individuals they identify certain parts as um, self. And so I I know I identified with um, particular parts of me, parts that um, held shame and guilt and um, destructive decisions. And so I identified myself with those parts and I learned um, from the IFS model that, you know, the parts aren't necessarily um, who I am. And so I got the opportunity to work with those um, parts and be um, loving and compassionate towards those parts, knowing that um, the parts um, weren't the full measure of who I am as a um, person. I think that's one of the true beauties of the IFS model. Did you find like in these circles, when you start talking about parts, do you find that that men have a harder time in jail or easier time in jail? I think Steve can speak more to um, that. Um, I've had limited um, experience with um, parts work um, behind the wall. Well, I think there's a way in which if I know that uh, that I have to keep certain parts out front in the environment, uh, 
then I do have something underneath that that will really define my essence. And so just knowing that, that there's a difference between how, how I present myself in the outside and how I am inside, is a big, uh, a big discovery. Uh, it's an insight that I can use to, dis to disidentify from those parts and unblend in a way which would be very helpful for my own growth and discovery, for example, that to be vulnerable is also a strength, you know, as opposed to just a weakness. And uh, I think that's, you know, again, a cultural uh, learning that men go through, which is I need to be tough in order to be a real man. And so there's a, a place to learn that there's that there's a, a that that's that's not a truth at at the, at the core for for people who are struggling with their identity and who I really am. I can begin to look further than that. Mm. But but having that having that vocabulary is useful uh, because it gives a, a kind of wedge to open up uh, the sense of possibility. Uh, in, a, in a world which seems to shut down a lot of possibility. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I can get out of from behind the stereotype and I don't have to live that stereotype in a way that's destructive for me and for others. Yeah. And it sounds like it's also like I can I can walk out of this room and I can put my big boy. I got to be tough guy. I can put that back on if I need to. Like, so it's not like Absolutely. I'm, I'm going to walk out of this room and now I'm all vulnerable and I, there's, I can't survive that. So I can put that back on. Yeah. Well, Glenn can tell you that, you know, one of the things we do on the weekends when we go in is we have a process called armor down, which is at the beginning of the weekend. And then when we're sitting in circle, we give them a chance to, to really let go of all the things that they have to carry as uh, inmates in the institution and they can begin to get underneath of that to a point of their of their real tenderness and 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 sense of sensibility and the gifts that they have that they want to share and so that becomes more evident and more possible but first you have to let go of that armor in order for it to happen I so that, that that's uh and then the longer period of time you have to do that and you can live in that other space then a lot of things begin to open up. You can begin to see that I don't have to live in this rigid way with this limited set of definitions of who I am. And I don't have to, to be the tough guy and I don't have to uh, demonstrate to others something about my insensitivity when I can show that I really do have the sensitivity. And so, for example, the way the feminine is looked at in prison is often a very strongly negative because of its association with the, the stereotypes of, of femininity. In other words, so it's the opposite of the masculinity. In other words, to, to put somebody down is to, to de describe their qualities as feminine in that context. And you know, to be misogynistic that way is a way that I can separate myself from my own weak parts that I'm afraid mm -hmm. to own and to, and to share, to reveal. Yeah. So there's a gender aspect to it that's important. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking about just how much of what you guys are talking about probably relates to sort of men in general, and then like black men even more specifically, and then incarcerated men even more specifically. But I'm thinking like, I wonder if sort of the average Joe listens to this and probably can really relate to what you guys are talking about. You know, my you son is 10 and he does if you cannot compare him to a girl he would be very upset and he's raised <laughs> by me so i'm not sure where that's coming from but he's it's really interesting well it's deeply rooted in the culture yeah. and then you have role models or negative role models that certainly have a lot of sway exert a lot of influence uh and then uh there's always a, a part of boys which is discovering their strength in their in being heroic, you know? And so the play of males it, as boys tends to reinforce the sense that I have to be an action hero. I have to be somebody doing things in the world in order to be having any worth or quality that's, that's uh, to be rewarded in society. 
And that begins the road that takes them begins to take them down that road, which is uh, I'm limiting my options. I'm, I'm climbing into the man box. I don't really want to, to show many sides of myself. And, and it can happen quite early. Even by the time you're 10, a boy is going to have a lot of layers to, to distance himself from what he might define as a sissy or weak or feminine or whatever the, whatever the definitions are. The interesting thing is that so many, so many boys uh, are coming out of single family homes with being raised by their mothers. So it really, in a way, it kind of reinforces some of that issue. Like I have to try extra hard to, to prove my masculinity in this circumstance. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because yeah. I might be seen as a mama's boy or something like that. Mm-hmm. My my child is a mama's boy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Good for him. <laughs> <laughs> Glenn, what was happening for you as Steve was talking? Um, a lot of uh, identification. A lot of identification. I know with um, me. Um, um, is a young black male um, growing up in the inner city. I, I know, um, especially with um, black males, there is uh, this deep sense of disempowerment. As young black men, you 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 feel this um, sense of um, disempowerment, this lack of access, but you know that there is there is a importance. In, in being male in a, um, a misogynistic or patriarchal um, society. So there's a, a, a premium put on your maleness and a lot of young black men know this, but because there's this um, sense of disempowerment, a lot of your identification with being male is through other means. Um, Like I said earlier, you know, just not showing vulnerability, not crying, not asking questions. And so I just remember for me getting the message that your male, um, your your sense of um, maleness, you know, um, is most important and that you should protect um, your masculinity with, at all costs. Right. And so there was this, you know, kind of fixation with your masculinity. Um, and a lot of us identified our masculinity with physicality or um, those other um, traits. And so I know that I used to hear a lot of well, you know, uh, you talk um, um, soft like a woman or you you punch like a girl. So that was the last thing or you run like a girl. And so there is definitely um, a, a, a gender aspect um, to it. Yeah. And so I think a lot of young men get duped um, in, in, into believing that your your maleness or your masculinity or your manhood is measured by how rigid you can be, how stoic you can be, um, how emotionless um, you can be. And as I said before, I know myself and a lot of my peers, um, we wanted nothing more to say, hey, I need some help. Um, I, I, I need someone to talk to. I need a shoulder to cry on. But because of that was something that was looked at um, is less than being a man, it was something you feared. Um, you, you feared showing vulnerability. You feared showing um, weakness. These things that were attributed with being feminine. So, so, and, and that still, it still exists. It, it, it still exists in a, in a lot of urban communities and just um, with um, young males, period. Um, as you mentioned, your son, um, a lot of people don't want to be associated with being a girl. And, and by the way, I, I grew up, I, to this day, I'm a, a, a mama's boy. 
Um, but so it's, it's interesting that, you know, I grew up being a mama's boy, but I never wanted to be associated with anything that suggested femininity. And so those are a lot of things that we have to address. And I think the IFS model does a perfect job in doing that type of work. Glenn, thank you explained that so beautifully. And I thought, right, because if for the Black man, if the only thing he has is his masculinity, that's the only power he has, mm -hmm. then of course he's going to lean into that, right? Of course mm -hmm. he's going to lean into that. And if he's only being raised by his mom, then he's got to make sure that he exiles any of that mm -hmm. femininity. Mm -hmm. you know, so you have two of those things, right? I'm, I'm being raised by my mom. And, you know, being masculine is the only power I have. So mm -hmm. I thought you, that was beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you for that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I'd like to share just that I think uh, the IFS model, uh, we, we came to it. I, in other words, I had worked in other contexts with other modalities before I, I learned IFS. But I realized in my work with uh, the model and with Dick Schwartz, who was very supportive, that um, there was a way in which we could use a lot of these skills to uh, to, to to deepen the sense of uh, what's possible for personal liberation. And so I, I, you know, that's where I'm coming from. In other words, I'm thinking of the, you know, that there's so much. Uh, potential here, not just for men behind bars, but for, for men in general and for women as well, to get in touch with uh, their core elements that they're going to touch their humanity and, and give them a vehicle for expressing their humanity. And, and, you know, there are lots of poems that we read about big boys don't cry and that kind of thing in our groups, just to make it clear that, you know, the, the 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 vulnerability is often the key, despite all of its the fact that it's taboo. It's often the key to discovering your human qualities, and so that's one of the things that that I think IFS led me to as well. And um, and there is there is uh, a lot of value in discovering how you can bring about transformation by. Uh, creating more internal space, whatever, however that looks, uh, just to have uh, an opportunity to to step back from uh, that in identification and, and uh, association with with parts gives me more of a repertoire, more of a, a sense of uh, an ability to work with my own energy and and to, to own who I am in a different way. So uh, that's that's a key piece. And, and for me, the, what I've seen with uh, the use of IFS inside is that we've been able to teach a number of men to be mentors in our program, to be circle, we call them circle guides, to sit in circle. And in that process, they're, they're trying on new skills and new identities and, and finding that they really do have something more to offer than they first thought they did. So there's a, there's a key piece there. Uh, and getting behind all of those identities and, the, and all of those uh, masks, as Glenn calls them, is essential, I, I think, for the walls to come down internally and also in externally as well. Of course, moving men to a place where they can begin to tap into their fullness as human beings. Uh, and that's really what boys need. That's really what we all need. What about you, Glenn? That was beautiful. Yeah, I'll just say um, um, quickly, you know, we talked a lot about um, femininity, femininity um, versus masculinity. We talked about black males, um, a lot of challenges um, there, um, incarceration. Um, and one of the things that I've discovered in my journey is that um, whether you're, you know, you're, you're, you're black or white, you're incarcerated, you're um, non-incarcerated, um, religious, um, non-religious. I've had an opportunity to meet a lot of people during the course of my journey. And, and what I realize is that our, our similarities are more important than our differences. 
and as um, Steve uh, mentioned about um, identities and identifications, um, I think we, we have the opportunity um, to transcend a lot of um, labels. We have a lot um, the opportunity to transcend um, stereotypes and stigmas. And so for me, that's the importance of the IFS model. Um, one of the things that um, really resonated with me is just reading the diversity statement um, when I started taking a course and how it gelled with my own values. And so I think we have the opportunity to really change the world, to, to make some valuable contributions. And I don't just say that just to say it. I, I, I truly um, believe that um, just based on my own um, journey and the people that I've um, met, um, like Steve Spitzer and a lot of other individuals on, on my journey. Um, I'm hoping to meet Dick um, Schwartz um, one day. I, I consider him a visionary you know, um, a revolutionary. So we have a lot of um, um, individuals that, that bring a lot of value into these different spaces. So um, I'm just looking forward to continue my journey with IFS and hope, hopefully incorporating it into the work in my community and my program um, and just keep um, making contributions and connected with um, others who are making those same type of contributions as well. And I and I and I think IFS, I think it's a way of life. Yeah. I, I think it's a way of life. I, I know that's how I live it. Yeah. Yeah. Completely agree. Completely agree. And I actually had a trainer in one of my trainings say that IFS is a way of life. It is yes. no longer a, mm -hmm. a therapy model. It is a therapy model, but it is a way of life. Yeah. And it sounds like, Glenn, that's what you're saying is, and Steve, you're saying the same thing, right? It's a way of life that we're taking into these prisons and we're sharing with the men in our groups. And then Glenn, you're saying you're taking it into the work you're doing and you're seeing just the, the healing that happens. Mm -hmm. not just in the therapy yeah. room, right? We got to get it out of the therapy room and take it, tell everybody. Yeah. Well, there's something really neat about the circle format because what it does is it makes everybody equal on the same level. And that's an enormous thing because you get away from the idea of somebody is the teacher and somebody's the student. Everybody's learning together. Everybody's exploring together. And that's the thing that makes, I think, makes a lot of it so powerful for what we're doing as a group process thing, because, uh, you know, we, we get to operate in a way where, for example, uh, I try to, to impart some of, of, the, of the wisdom that I have by May, being vulnerable in the circle myself. Mm -hmm. In other words, I, I go about modeling what I want to see the men get, but they're, they're going to take it in a lot different way when they see me going into my own stuff than when I stand on a pedestal apart from them. Right. Yeah, definitely. So that's important. No, I appreciated that. this opportunity a lot. And I think that uh, I presented at a couple of conferences, IFS conferences, and it was amazing how much, uh, responsiveness there was in the in the audience for 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 therapists to see the the ways in which the model could be used in very different settings yeah. and i brought with me some men like glenn who can talk about their own experience directly who have gone into ifs as a as a way of continuing their growth so it's it's a cool thing to uh to begin to open it and i know dick has that vision because He's talked to, to me a lot about the, the fact that, uh, you know, there is beyond therapy, there's a lot that can be done in the world. And community transformation is, is a key piece, especially around race and other issues. So I think that's what, what uh, we want to give some priority to. Thanks for hanging out today. If you like this episode, make sure you subscribe. And if you really like this episode, share it with a friend and leave a review. You can follow me on Instagram at IFS Tammy and join our community on Facebook at the One Inside Podcast. Talk to you next time.
Today's episode was sponsored by Brighter Vision. What's the point of having a beautiful website if it doesn't attract the clients you want to see? As the worldwide leaders of website design for therapists, Brighter Vision sees this issue happen way too often. A nice looking website doesn't equate to a successful website. The truth is, your current website might even be turning off potential clients. That's where Brighter Vision comes in. Brighter Vision's team of website designers will create a website that is centered around attracting and retaining your ideal client so that you can have a nice looking website as well as a successful one. Better yet, Brighter Vision is offering $100 off exclusively for listeners of the One Inside podcast. To take advantage of this offer, simply go to brightervision.com backslash inside. Again, that's brightervision.com backslash inside.